Here we go, continuing unit three. We are taking a look now at separation of solutions and chromatography. So we have looked at putting solutions together and how to draw them. And now we're gonna look at how do we take them apart? How do we separate those um, pieces out? So intermolecular forces and mixtures can be utilized to separate out the components of a solution using chromatography and distillation. So we're going to be applying our ideas of intermolecular forces to help us understand how to separate our substances. All right, solutions and mixtures. The key to being able to separate a solution or mixture of substances is to remember that they are all chemicals that are occupying the same container, but are not chemically combined. They have not gone through a chemical reaction. So each chemical retains its properties, and therefore those properties can help us separate the chemicals from one another. The properties we'll use here to separate mixtures is their boiling point and their solubility. Those are the two areas we're gonna focus on. So let's look at distillation. Distillation is pretty interesting. It's a process of separating liquid mixtures based on their boiling points. So the distillation process is pretty simple but can be used in complex applications. Um, so, our steps of distillation. Over here, I've got a picture of our complete apparatus, our, all of our equipment, and we can see um, kind of all of these pieces going on. So, we've got basic setup of a ring stand with a clamp holding a container. Underneath it, we can have a Bunsen burner or a hot plate, some sort of heating element. It is a capped um, container, and then we place a thermometer in it. All right, the next chunk of the apparatus has this condensing tube. That's what that's called. And you'll notice that there's kind of a section that goes all the way through, and that's where our chemicals are gonna be traveling. And then around it, it has a secondary tube where cold water comes in and leaves the tube. So that's helping to condense the um, gas back into a liquid. Um, and then over here, we have a um, flask um, receiving flask or distillate flask and um, our chemicals coming out. So let's look at the process. So a mixture is added to the distillation flask at the beginning, shown on the left, and the equipment is assembled. We put everything together. The mixture is boiled to a desired temperature to allow one chemical to boil and leave behind the other chemical. So we want to know what's in our mixture so that we can tell what temperature we should keep it heating to. We don't want to overheat our substance and cause everything to evaporate and boil away. So the boiling chemical turns to vapor here and travels up the flask and because everything's kept, it will travel into the condenser. Gases are always going to want to expand into whatever space they can. So as it flows through this condenser, there is, um, this picture doesn't have it, but these, this little arm tube here would have a little um, escape valve basically or an opening that allows the air that's in here already to escape as that gas starts to fill the container. So in the condenser section, the vapor that we're, the gas that we are boiling off and monitoring its temperature um, is going to start cooling because it's got this cold water, um, this cold glass around it basically cooled by that water and it's going to um, cool that whole chamber and condense that gas back into a liquid. So the boiling chemical uh, or the condensed um, Let's see, where are we at? In the condenser, the vapor is cooled back to a liquid by the cold water flowing around the tube. The liquid flows into the receiving flask, where it's called the distillate. So as this, this chemical cools, as the gas cools, it's going to turn into a liquid, turn into droplets, and then it's going to drip down over here. So it stays um, in our setup the whole time. Now, um, as it drips down here, um, the reason we're at an angle is to help facilitate that liquid dripping into our flask, and we call this part, our end result, the distillate. That's the chemical we're separating, all right? So the one with the lower boiling point is going to be our distillate, the one that we're separating from the rest of the mixture. 
And at that point, if you just have two chemicals, you've got your them separated. If you have more than two chemicals, you can still do a distillation, um, but we call it a <coughs> excuse me a fractional distillation. So you might take a have it at a certain temperature boiling away and collect one chemical and then put that aside and put a new flask, heat up this mixture more to separate out another chemical. So that is something else we can do. So to determine what the distillate is, we often are asked in our AP Chem questions to determine which chemical will be the distillate or the chemical that separates from the mixture first. So the chemical is, um, this chemical is the one in the mixture that has the lower boiling point. And because it has a lower boiling point, this is the one with weaker intermolecular forces. In the previous picture, um, it was a mixture of sodium chloride and water, which is um, a solid in water, but once it's dissolved, it has kind of some different aspects to it. So we can still use it in this distillation process. Um, you could also just evaporate the water. Um, so the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, while sodium chloride doesn't boil until 1,465 degrees Celsius. So if we heat that mixture, the water is the only part that's going to leave because it's going to boil first um, and leave the sodium chloride behind. So our distillate that we separate out is pure water. Um, this is why we you know, drink distilled water that's been boiled and gone through this process. Um, it's just a lot larger scale. Um, another example, a mixture of water and methanol are separated by distillation. Which chemical will be initially or will initially be in a higher concentration in the distillate? All right, so let's think about this. We've got water. Draw our molecule, bent water there. And we've got CH3 OH. So let's think about our intermolecular forces. Hopefully by now we're like, oh yeah, water is bent, it's polar, it has London dispersion forces, hydrogen bonding, right? Really strong hydrogen bonds. And water can hydrogen bond with both of its hydrogens, all right? Both of these allow its hydrogen bond. Now methanol has this nonpolar part with, just, with its London dispersion forces. And then it's got that OH just like water. So it can also hydrogen bond with other molecules. So they're both involved in similar processes. Now the difference um, in their boiling point and their structures is that water can hydrogen bond twice as much as the methanol can. So water would have stronger forces. Okay, so it says which chemical will be initially in higher concentration in the distillate. Basically, which one are we going to separate out of our mixture? Which one's going to boil first? So the one with weaker forces will boil first and be in our distillate. Our one with weaker forces in this case would be the CH3OH because it can only hydrogen bond once while water can hydrogen bond twice. So water is a little stronger in its intermolecular forces. So if we looked up the boiling point of these two chemicals, we would see that methanol has a lower boiling point. So when we heat this mixture, we would want to keep our boiling point under water's boiling point. We wouldn't want to jump it up to like 100 degrees Celsius because then everything can boil away. We'd want to keep it lower, closer to methanol's boiling point to make sure that that's the only thing we are separating out. Now, can we stop every water molecule from heating up and leaving? No. Um, we can do our best to do that and really control that temperature, but dis distillation is not always perfect. We're not going to get necessarily like pure methanol off of this. Alcohols, um, for instance, when distillation is occurring with alcohols that um, you know adults can drink, because um, this is how that process, how their ref those alcohols are refined, you can't get 100% alcohol out of that. Um, it's not possible. So. There's always going to be a little bit of water that comes with it, but we can purify it as much as we can. All right, the other thing we can do is called fractional distillation. So it's slightly more sophisticated, and it separates a mixture that has more than two parts to it. Um, that mixture is heated to separate one chemical at a time, and that chemical is collected, and then another container is placed to collect the next chemical. Um, the mixture may be slowly heated to higher temperatures to collect each 
additional substance. Now, this can occur on large scale um, in industries like the oil industry. Crude oil that's pumped out of the ground is a mixture of all of the different substances we use. We get from it um, methane, natural gas, we get our gasoline in our cars, we get kerosene, we get propane, we get butane. We get all of these chemicals that we use for different applications. Um, and so they have very large scale distillation that they do to separate all of these components of our oil out and collect them. Now we are going to take a look at chromatography, which is a little more in depth on this topic because it has a little more um, complexity to how it works, but not impossible at all. So chromatography is a method of separating mixtures based on the solubility of the chemicals in the mixture with the given solvent used in the experiment. So let's take a look at the setup. We've got a couple of pictures here for reference to help us out. So we'll take a look at this first picture of the, the start of the process and then we'll go from there. So at the bottom, we're gonna draw a starting line and we use pencil here. The reason we use pencil is because we're going to be separating things out and if it was ink, it could smear everywhere. Pencil is not gonna smear. Um, during our experiment. So that's why we want a pencil line. And we do it um, near the end of the strip, but not at the um, at the very end. We want to leave maybe a, a, a centimeter or so gap at the bottom. Um, and we use what's called a strip of filter paper, or we can use what's called TLC paper, which is called thin layer chromatography. We'll be talking about that. So whatever type of paper we're using, we're going to add that line so we have a starting line. We'll need a reference. Then we're going to place our samples of our mixture on that line to be separated from one another. So we're placing dots of each chemical along the line. So you can see we've got chemical X. That's probably an unknown. And then we've got A, B, C, and D. Those are reference ones likely. So we would be separating each of those to see what they look like and then identifying what chemical X is made of. So we place the samples along that. We just, we're gonna use um, a method to just dot a little bit of each chemical along that line. And then we place the solvent into our container. Sometimes it's a beaker or sometimes there is a reaction chamber that we use. So we place enough solvent in the container to touch the bottom of the paper. Notice that it's at the bottom, but not touch the samples. We do not want to get those samples wet right at the beginning because if it touches the samples, it's going to bleed them down into the solvent instead of them flowing up the paper, which is our goal. Okay. So there is some, some measuring and some things we want to be careful of in this situation. Number four shows us our, starts talking about um, what it looks like. So we're going to allow the solvent to soak up through the paper. It's kind of like if you dipped a piece of paper towel or napkin into water and it soaks up through that paper towel. Um, so we allow the solvent to, to touch the bottom of the paper and then the, the solvent is going to soak up through the paper. And when it does that, um, it's going to carry with it, as we can see in this picture down here, the chemicals. So the different components, the different parts of our mixture are going to get separated from each other. So this is a sample of black ink and it's separating into blue and orange and yellow and red ink. Those are all mixed to make this particular type of black ink. So over time we allow the chemical, the solvent to soak up and it's going to carry the different samples up. Now, we allow that to happen until the, what we call the solvent front, so the top edge of where our solvent is soaking up the paper, till it's almost to the end. We do not want to let it go all the way to the end because that can mess up our data. We need a nice, clean reference line. Okay. Um, and then the result on the paper is referred to as a chromatograph. So what we get is a chromatograph. Um, 
So we're going to have a starting line, we're going to have an ending line, and we'll probably have to mark that ending line with another pencil mark because the solvent will evaporate. Typically, they are very easy chemicals that can easily evaporate. So we'll want to mark those lines before it evaporates, and then we can analyze our, our results, our chromatograph. So there's some vocabulary that we want to be aware of, and you can fill this out um, on your vocab list. So the stationary phase is um, one of our first terms. So to separate chemicals, we must have a platform on which to separate them. In our case, the platform is paper, or um, it can be that TLC plate. The paper does not move in the process of chromatography, chromatography. therefore we call it the stationary phase. I always remember it because paper is a form of stationary, so it is the part that stays still and allows the chemicals to move. Your mobile phase um, is another key part. So a mobile phase is the solvent that carries the chemicals through the stationary phase. So the solvent we put in the beaker or the flask and then um, dip our paper in. Chemicals do not or don't move on paper alone, but if we add a solvent, it can draw and pull those chemicals up through the paper. The polarity of the solvent affects which chemicals will travel further up the paper. The more miscible the solvent and the chemical in the mixture are, the further the chemical will travel, travel with the solvent. So miscible means the more alike they are or the more um, they dissolve each other, the more the chemical will move. So if you've got a polar solvent, we're going to have a, um, our more polar chemicals are going to travel further. If you've got a non-polar solvent, our non-polar chemicals travel further. Our point of origin is the spot where you put your chemicals on the stationary phase, where that pencil line is to start, basically. Developing um, is after putting our chemicals on that point, and um, our chromatogram can be developed, kind of like we develop film in a camera. And you guys don't have cameras like that. All right. <laughs> we used to develop film in cameras. Um, so the mobile phase can be pulled through the stationary phase. So I said kind of like developing photograph, but um, as the process is basically occurring, we call that developing the chromatograph. And then we have our solvent front, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, that is the wet moving edge of the solvent, and we want to stop the solvent front from continuing to move by taking the paper out of the solvent. So when we're like, oh, it's done, make it stop, we want to just pull that paper out of our solvent. So another thing we need to be aware of is called the retention factor. So the distance our chemicals move during chromatography is typically less or is um, than the distance the mobile phase or solvent moves. Not typically, always. I'm going to change that terminology here. So we can measure the difference in the distance by using the RF value or retention factor. So the distance a chemical moves on the paper or stationary phase during the separation divided by the distance the mobile phase moves is our retention factor. So for instance, if water is used as the mobile phase and food dye is our solute that we're trying to um, analyze, the paper is the stationary phase. The RF value will always be the same in this system. So if we use the same materials, our RF factor should be consistent and the same. Changing our mobile phase to alcohol will change the RF factor for the food dive because it has a different affinity or attraction to the alcohol than it does to water. So this is our formula, our, distant, our distance the solute travels divided by the distance the solvent travels. So we're going to measure this, the distance from our, um, our reference line or point of origin. to our sample. So where did it start? Where did it end? And then the um, we're going to do point of origin to the solvent front. That's the distance we would measure for those two. This is always less than one. Always. It is going to be Yes, less than one every time. Okay, 
Um, oh, it says it down here. Um, so since our solute always travels less distance than the solvent, right, we should always have a smaller number and our solute is traveling further. It's a larger number on the bottom. We always get something less than one. So let's look at how we calculate this. We'll try this out. So you notice we've got our reference line at the bottom. If I mess it up here. Um, we've got two samples, and then we've got our solvent front at the top. So this is the result of taking a sample that we dot here, putting it in our solvent, and letting it that solvent soak up the paper till it reaches near the top and then taking it out. And you can see we've got two samples that have been separated. Now we want to make sure that we're always measuring from the same point. You can see that they're measuring from the top edge here. So that's where we want to measure from. And we're going to calculate our retention factor. So to calculate our retention factor, we are going to um, start with, we're going to do it for the yellow molecule. So we want the distance our solute travels, so the distance the yellow spot travels, and it's marked as 5.8 centimeters. And we, then we want the distance the solute travels, so 8.5 centimeters. And we're going to go ahead and divide those. Our centimeters are going to cancel, so this is just a ratio of how far they travel. So 5.8 over 8.5 gives us 0 0.68. All right, so that is our retention factor for our yellow dye here. Um, for the blue or cyan one, we've got that it traveled 3.1 centimeters, and the solvent still traveled 8.5. Those should be the same no matter which chemical we're using. So if we divide those, we're going to see we get a smaller value. We get 0.36, so almost half of what the yellow one traveled. Um, so these show us that the, the chemical with that larger retention factor is more soluble in our solvent. And that our one that traveled less distance is less soluble in the solvent. So depending on what our solvent was, we can determine some properties of our chemicals, like their polarity or maybe what kind of intermolecular forces they might have. Okay, let's look at another example of how um, we can analyze a situation from chromatography and what kind of information it can tell us. So if um, for number one over here, if the solvent used to make the following chromatograph was water, which chemical solute is more polar? So we've got, um, we can obviously see in our picture here, we've got our solvent, and it's telling us that that is water. We can see that the solvent went up our chromatography paper, we've got our solvent front there, and it has separated two components in a mixture. So those components would have started further down and would have been mixed together, and we've separated them to a red and a blue component. So we want to know which chemical is more polar. So to analyze this, we want to think about our solvent first before we think about the chemicals. So our solvent is water. We want to ask ourselves, what um, is that solvent more polar or more nonpolar? Well, water is our lovely bent structure. It um, has... Um, the ability to hydrogen bond. So we have both London dispersion forces, hydrogen bonding, which is that form of dipole-dipole forces, so very polar in this case. So we want to know which chemical, uh, uh, which solute is more polar. So remember our solvent is going to carry up the paper um, the chemical that is more alike it. So the chemical that is also more polar is going to travel further up the paper. So since the um, blue chemical tra traveled further up, it would be chemical A or component A that would be more polar. So the chemical that is more alike to the solvent is going to travel further, okay? The one is that is more similar to the solvent is going to travel further. So we could also say in this situation that that one would have a higher RF value. That's another way. If we had the RF values, 
instead of a picture, we would know that the higher the RF value, the more alike that chemical is to the solvent. In our second question, it says if the blue chemical, so our one towards the top, is nonpolar, which of the following is most likely, likely the solvent? So again, if we're, we're kind of reversing the situation, we know the blue chemical traveled furthest, so it is most similar to our solvent. Okay, so if our blue chemical is nonpolar, then that means that our solvent must also be nonpolar. Well, we can automatically cross out our water based on our previous question. That's going to be polar. We've got C6H14. Um, this is hexane. Um, they, we've got carbons and hydrogens uh, only. So this is going to be a nonpolar substance. And then we've got C2H5OH, this is called ethanol or ethyl alcohol. It's got that OH, it's allowed to hydrogen bond. That's going to be a polar molecule. So our nonpolar solvent is going to interact with our nonpolar um, component in our mixture, which traveled the furthest. So it is most similar to our solvent. Now, let's just take a moment and think about this. If I said the blue chemical is polar, then my solvents could be either water or the ethane, or excuse me, ethyl alcohol, all right? All right, so when we look at the RF values, it can help us determine what's going on with our chemicals and their polarity. So when you have a polar solvent, when that is used, um, the more polar chemicals will have a higher RF value. So those are our chemicals that go um, towards the top of your chromatography paper or plate. So if it's polar uh, solvent and our polar chemicals will go towards the top. So they'll, the ones that travel the furthest will match the polarity closer to your solvent. So if we had a nonpolar solvent, then the more nonpolar chemical will have the higher RF values and be at the top. Okay. Now, if we look at the, at the opposite way, if we had a polar solvent, our most nonpolar chemical will have the lowest RF value and be at the bottom of your paper. So the polarity of your solvent is going to help you determine the polarity of your chemicals that you're separating on your chromatography plate or paper. So let's look at another example. In a paper chromatography experiment, a sample of pigment is separated into two components, X and Y, as shown in the figure below. So let's take a look. We've got our pigment sample here on a piece of filter paper. It's in our solvent. And then we've got the, the before and the after. So the time at zero and the time after 30 minutes. So they let this sit for 30 minutes and we see the separation of our two pigments, our two colors. It says, what can be concluded about X and Y based on the experimental results? Now, our options here, we've got that the masses are different versus the polarity. Well, I'm going to go ahead and cross out A and B because nothing we've discussed so far had anything to do with the, ma the mass of our chemical. The mass of the chemical does not affect how far it goes in chromatography. What it's dependent upon is its interaction with the solvent. Okay, so now we want to see which one's more polar. Well, that's going to depend on our solvent. Hexane, C6H14, is our solvent. Well, that is nonpolar. So what we know is that our more nonpolar chemical is going to travel further. Nonpolar. Now, our two answers say are saying X is more polar than Y or Y is more polar than X. Well, if X is more nonpolar because it's similar to our solvent, then Y has to be the more polar one. Y is more polar than X. Okay, so we're connecting all of those pieces together. What's happening with our solvent? How does that affect our components in our mixture? And then what does that tell us about those chemical? So since it's a nonpolar solvent, we're going to have the nonpolar chemical go further, which means Y is more polar because it's staying behind. Now, 
let's take a look at this. This is called column chromatography. It's another form of chromatography. It's still separating chemicals, um, and it's just a little more sophisticated. So column chromatography consists of a stationary, so we still have a stationary phase, and it's a solid phase that it says adsorbs. This is not absorb like a paper towel absorbs water, okay? It's not that. It's adsorb. So something, a chemical sticking to something else is called adsorption. It's like I think about it as adding it to the surface of another substance. Um, so the stationary solid phase that adsorbs and separates the compounds passing through it with the help of a liquid mobile phase. So we still have a mobile phase. We still have a solvent moving through. And we still have this stationary phase staying behind. So in our picture over here, all of these black dots are representing the stationary phase. Okay, the part that's not moving. That would be um, the part that's going to attract other chemicals. And then we've got our um, sample placed at the top here. Okay, so based on their chemical properties, some compounds get absorbed or stuck on the stationary phase and the others get eluded or passed through with the mobile phase of solvent. So we're going to add our sample and then we're going to be adding solvent to push it through our column. Okay, so we're using gravity to help us. We're pouring chemicals through and then we're catching them at the bottom at the end. So in this example, the sample, which is in purple, is introduced into the column. It starts to flow down, and as we can see, the blue is moving slower. So as we start to see it, we start to see the separation, and the blue is getting kind of left behind a little more. So it's the blue is more attracted to the stationary phase than the red chemical is. The red moves through quicker, so it separates first, and the blue is second. All right, so it's telling us that the, the red is being carried through our um, our column with the solvent and the blue is staying behind as it's sticking more to the stationary phase. What's used most often is what's called silica gel. Um, so chemical or picture A is what's those thin layer chromatography sheets or TLC. Um, so for both thin layer chromatography, and we can see this example in letter B, these multiple pictures of um, column chromatography, um, we're using silica, SiO2. So it's that covalent network solid we talked about um, earlier in the unit when we looked at different solids. So it's a gel is kind of created with it, and that's this kind of hazy part that's in here and the white part on the TLC plate. So they take a piece of plastic in TLC, the silica is spread on a thin layer um, or any thin layer on a piece of plastic or sometimes glass and um, you have to be really careful with it because it can just chip right off. In column chromatography the silica is placed in the column with the solvent. So we can see our sample is placed at the top and then they add more solvent to it and it pushes all of our um, chemicals through and allows them to separate. So silica is polar and will attract a lot of chemicals. So our stationary phase is really polar. So it's typically used more often with nonpolar or slightly polar solvents. Um, so the, the polar part is your paper or your column. The nonpolar part is the liquid, and it's pulling the nonpolar chemicals through. So in paper chromatography, the paper is made of cellulose, um, which is also polar. So in, when we're just using regular filter paper chromatography, it's um, kind of a normal type of paper. So that one, it just depends on our solvent who travels further. So when do we use each of these? We looked at distillation and different forms of chromatography. So when do we use them? We learned about filtration in the first unit. So that is another method. So it was used when mixtures contain a solid and a liquid phase and they can be separated by a filter. That's based on the state of matter. So that's when we had our filter and we had our flask below to catch the filtrate and we had our solid left behind. Okay, and then we had our, our uh, filtrate down below. 
Distillation is used when the boiling points of their components are different enough to separate them. So we're basing it off the boiling point. So we have those mixtures of liquids, and we're boiling one of them off or uh, multiple of them off at different temperatures to separate them. Paper or thin layer chromatography is used when the number of chemicals and their relative polarity is needed to be found in the mixture. So we're basing it off the solubility of our chemicals. Thin layer chromatography or TLC is better when the chemicals do not have a color because UV light can be used to see the chemicals. Um, so that's another little strategy, which is kind of cool. So you may not be able to see the chemicals color, but we can use UV light to help us. It'll glow on the thin layer chromatography sheet. And the last one, the column chromatography is, is or column chromatography is used when a larger quantity of mixture needs to be separated into its, each component component to purify them. So again, it's based off the solubility of our chemicals. So we're using that um, column to allow those chemicals to drain out um, and collect each one. So we can collect multiple samples, sort of like distillation, and really separate the chemicals. Uh, and purify them. Um, distillation versus chromatography are used in different ways or in different applications because maybe two chemicals have too close of boiling points so it's, we can't separate them using distillation or it might be that um, they're too um, uh, they're too hard to boil. Um, they have higher boiling points, so it's too hard to heat them and get them to separate like that. So we use column chromatography. Um, so there's different applications for each one of these methods of separation. The key thing, we want to know what they're based on. So filtration is state of matter, distillation is boiling point, and then no matter which type of chromatography, it's based on solubility. So um, you're going to have some practice questions on this and some lab um, work to do around this to help you really solidify these ideas uh, to look at more at distillation and chromatography, especially since we've already looked at filtration. All right. Thanks, guys.